Hi everyone and welcome to American Literature Part 1. This is the first lecture in our series and we're going to be looking at an overview of American literature. So let's get started. Before I get into the timeline and then I explain each different literary movement, I want you to think about what is going to be one of the driving questions for our course. Our authors and their works cannot be seen in isolation. So I think we have a tendency, um, as I'm recording this in 2020, there's a lot of issues about the past and people who um, were thought of as wonderful people and heroes of American history or American literature. And then as we look back at them, we say, well, look, this person did some things well, but they also had very racist views, or maybe they believed in gender stereotypes, or maybe they um, were in some way sort of problematic. But what I want you to do for this course is think about the context in which the author is writing. Many of the authors, even though they're not quite as progressive or open-minded or tolerant as we are today, were really ahead of their time. So we're going to be talking about for each book the historical and cultural context in which the author is writing. So what literary movement or school of thought came before? What literary movement or school of thought is the author a part of as they write? How are there some tensions between the author and these literary movements of the past or during the time when they're writing? And then how are they reacting to the past and their current time to push forward into the future. If you think of this idea of like a pendulum swinging from one end to the other, a lot of times we'll have a literary movement that um, starts here and then people are like, no, those thoughts and ideas are horrible and we're gonna swing over in this direction. And then sometimes people swing right back, right? So that is basically one of to erase that, that's basically one of the thoughts that I'd like you to keep in mind. Where were we, where are we, and where are we going for each of the books that we are going to be reading. So let's take a look at the timeline. I'm going to go through each one of these literary movements and describe it in more detail, but just so you have a general overview. Pre-1620, um, for American literature, that's going to be the Native American period and European exploration. So really before the colonies were fully established. Um, 1492, Columbus arriving in the Bahamas. 1607, the Jamestown colony being established. And then the Mayflower landing in 1620 kind of moves us into our next period of Puritanism and colonialism. Now, after that period, um, coming into the American Revolution, we have the revolutionary um, and early nationalism. Sometimes this is also called the Age of Reason. It lasts um, till about 1815, and then we begin. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the Revolutionary War took place. And then also after the War of 1812, which would be that early nationalism period. Then in around 1830 to 1860, we have transcendentalism, which kind of happens around the same time as romanticism. So when we get to those, we'll talk about how they have some similar features. At this same time, from the 1770s to the 1860s, we also see a lot of slave narratives, and we'll be reading one of those for this course. We, of course, then have the Civil War taking place, 1861 to 1865, and that is where the first half of the, the pair of American literature classes, um, this is where our class will end. So American Literature Part 1 at our school goes from the beginnings to the 1860s. Part 2 picks up after the 1860s. And then we see realism and naturalism um, up here. We see the modernism period during World War I, really from World War I through the Great Depression and up until World War II. And then after World War II is the postmodern period. 
So if you're interested um, after this course, what you've learned about the literature, the culture, the history of the United States, um, you can continue and take American Lit 2 as well. But let's just focus on the literary movements that we'll be covering. Oh, I forgot about the contemporary period. <laughs> some people think we're still in postmodernism and some people think that it's a little bit different, but that's, that's a question for, for American Lit 2 to answer. All right, so our Native American period is really before 1620, although there is obviously Native American literature taking place throughout the history of the country. But this particular study features a lot of oral traditions of songs and stories. The original authors were unknown. The written accounts actually come after colonization. So what happens is that you have a, a number of ethnographers, people who are interested in culture, and also some missionaries who are going out into um, interact with the Native American tribes, and some Native Americans themselves who learn English or French or um, another European language and begin to translate some of their songs and stories. What ends up happening is that you have a lot of differences between these stories because they are oral traditions. Um, so creation stories such as myths and totems, if you look up, um, for example, Native American creation story, and let's say you're, you're looking at a particular tribe, um, <laughs> you can find websites, you can find things on YouTube, you can find, um, various depictions of the same story and they'll all be quite different and then you can read the youtube comments about people arguing that that's not the story that they learned because they're they're coming from the oral traditions we have an archetype of trickster or conjurer a lot of times in those stories so those songs and stories focus on the natural world as being sacred the importance of land and place, and again, as I said, the variations in tales, so characters, settings, and themes that might be between different tribes or races. Here are just some pictures, the trickster coyote. A trickster is an interesting character that's kind of amoral. Um, they can get away with things that regular people can't because they're outside of morality, but they're not evil necessarily. Creation folk tales, and um, this is just a depiction of New York, the Six Nations homelands prior to the colonists coming in. So you can see the Algonquin, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Oneonta, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. So, also at this point, you have European exploration and early colonization. So this featured a lot of nonfiction writing, things like journals, ship logs, letters, military records, and reports. Um, and they come from really a wide variety of sources. Now, if you're interested in this, I used to teach these things, but I think that they're much more fitting for an American history course, um, and a lot of times, our history classes will look at primary sources, so things that came from the time period, like journals and ship logs and letters. And you can really see the truth behind a lot of the American myths. So what was Columbus's voyage really like? Why was he taken back to Spain in chains? And um, who was Bartolome de las Casas? And how did he play a role in what happened to Columbus and after? What, how were the natives really treated when they first came into the Caribbean? Um, not well, but you can get a lot of detail from those writings. Um, there's a lot of information about what life was like back then, for example, from the Diary of Cortez. What did he see? Why was he traveling to the area he was traveling? What was he trying to find or accomplish? Um, Native American responses to attacks and invasions. And they really focused on preserving the memories of their experiences, communicating their experience to others who may follow or who may provide financial support. Um, so, for example, 
when you look at a ship log um, or a journal or a diary from that time, they were they had patrons who were sending them out on these journeys. So some of their writing is to tell their patrons, hey, here are the riches of the land and sometimes how we can exploit them and, um, and to get information um, to them for further financial support. Distant difficulties in communicating over time and distance because they were gone for quite longer periods of time. That is um, a picture. I wish it was labeled. This is a picture of various journeys to the New World by different um, explorers. So you can see Cartier, Columbus, Vespucci, Hudson, um, all different places that they that they went. Um, that's a depiction of explorers need, meeting a tribe of Native Americans for the first time. You can see that they're putting up a cross, that they have the three ships um, of legend, and that they're being given things. The New England Sabbath in the winter, going to Sunday um, church, and again, some of their some of their all right, and then we come into the colonial period. So this is really where our class, um, at least this semester that I'm recording this, this is where our class is going to pick up. Newly arrived colonists who create villages and towns and establish new governments while protesting the old ways in Europe. These people were religiously oppressed by kings and queens who enforced their religious beliefs on to their people. Literature of the period was really dominated by the Puritans and their religious influence with an emphasis on God and the need for faith in daily life. Now, there's a lot of um, misconceptions about Puritans and it's interesting because we'll also be looking at a book that depicts Puritans um, a couple hundred years later. But the Puritans really, it, it's not that they didn't enjoy life because they did. They have poetry that describes um, a lot of the romantic feelings toward each other. They have poetry about, you know, the love, the romantic love between husbands and wives and things of that nature. But they also had some other beliefs that um, made them seem quite a bit more serious. And many of them were that they needed to show their faith in their daily lives um, by doing acts of good service, which then led to them sort of criticizing some of the people that they did not feel were doing these things, um, which then in turn led to the witch trials and some of the things that they're a little bit more famous for. But writing, a lot of their writing was utilitarian and instructive sermons, diaries, personal narratives, and they were known for the plain Puritan style, so being simple and direct. They also did have some poetry and stories, but all of these had a religious emphasis. Um, this is a depiction of Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Um, up there and people are falling down and fainting and wanting to be saved as he as he preaches. There it is. Um, Anne Bradstreet wrote quite a bit of poetry. And her work really shows what it was like to be a Puritan woman at that time. So concerns about religion, but also her family, her domestic sphere, her children, um, some of the children that she lost and the heartbreak over that and the um, struggles of trying to do good in the world, which is something that I think everybody can relate to. The revolutionary period from about 1750 to about 1815, as I said, during the Revolutionary War and then also through the War of 1812, a lot of the writers in this period explain or justify the American Revolution. Just after the revolution, this period becomes known as early nationalism, and writers begin to ponder what it means to be an American. So some of the books that we are reading fall into this period, and one of them will have a lot more of a European flavor because America is such a 
newly formed nation. Um, the other book that we're going to be looking at really is considered um, an important part of American literature because it has more of an American feel. So it's set in very distinct part of the newly formed United States. And there are so, still in both books some of these themes. What does it mean to be American? Um, what do we have to look at in terms of um, faith versus reason? And not that those things can't go together, but reason and science as opposed to just faith alone. Um, philosophy, political science, even though we're looking at fictional works, these are still important themes to consider. So influenced by these Enlightenment ideals, colonists by the end of the 18th century try to establish a new and revolutionary political order based on democratic principles. And writing begins to shift from being plain and straightforward to highly ornate. So a lot of the people during this time are using rhetoric rhetorical strategies to argue or to persuade. And even in fiction, some of these rhetorical devices are still used. Um, many, um, many people are still writing things that are considered utilitarian, so things that are meant for specific use. Pamphlets, speeches, letters. The first book that we're going to look at is a seduction novel, so the, the utilitarian purpose in Charlotte Temple is to help young women not be seduced, right? That's kind of the purpose. And the author's message is going to be a lot more important to her than the, in some ways, than the actual story itself. By the time we get to the book Wheeland by Charles Brockton Brown, he has a lot of philosophical themes relating to early nationalism and um, kind of the opposition of the age of reason versus the previous age of faith, but he also is much more concerned about the story, and his book is a lot more American, set in Pennsylvania, um, and we start pushing into the next period of literature um, later on with Romanticism. So here are some of the other works. Um, the Federalist Papers you may have looked at in high school. The autobiography of Ben Franklin. They were influenced by people like Rousseau and Voltaire, philosophers like uh, is depicted down here. And we begin to have the novel come up as its own separate genre. Um, but again, as I said, it's still kind of for a purpose. Just telling a story isn't going to be enough, at least not for people during that period of time. And then we come to romanticism, which kind of overlaps a little bit, <clears throat> which is why Charles Broxton Brown's novel kind of falls in the middle um, as it was published in 1798. Um, the writing here begins to include more fiction and poetry. There are much fewer philosophical and political treatises. Um, by this time, the nation is formed and literature starts to be a form of entertainment. So it's not just seen as being used for political or religious or educational purposes, which really would have been important to the Puritans, especially to um, two movements before. The Puritans would have thought that fiction might be um, considered lies and therefore it might be evil in some ways. So poetry is okay as an established art form and as a way to express emotions. Um, a lot of the poems of that period, as I said, were about daily life. Some of them are like interpretations or thoughts on, on pieces of scripture. But then as the country's coming together, a lot of the thinkers were really focused on um, how can we find political freedom? And now we have a little bit of room to breathe. So we can uh, have really this philosophical reaction against those previous decades where reason and rational thought and also um, the, the religious aspect really dominated the works. And they start to celebrate individualism, nature, imagination, creativity, intuition, and a focus really on strong emotions. So understanding 
before Freud, a little bit of that psychology. Why do we think the way that we do? We have a lot of symbolism in these works and a complete blossoming of short stories, novels, poetry, and most of the books that we're going to be looking at are from this particular period, um, in part because they're more interesting and there's a little bit more to talk about, and also in part because, as I said, a lot of the nonfiction works you'll look at in a history course. So the subsets of Romanticism, transcendental um, transcendentalist writers have a belief that man's nature is inherently good, that all people have within them a divine spark or an inner light that produces individualism and therefore we should be self-reliant. Many of these writers became abolitionists and prohibitionists because slavery denied the divine spark in slaves and so they said, look, these are people, many of whom um, have become people of faith, and many of whom have taught themselves how to write, how to um, write their own, they've written slave narratives describing their experiences and their quest for freedom, and slavery is denying this in people, and therefore it is a bad institution that we should abolish, we should get rid of it. In terms of prohibition, they felt that alcohol led people away from their inner light. So it dulls the senses, it makes people act strange or funny, it does not help them come to a better version of themselves. The transcendentalists have a lot of other beliefs as well, but we'll get to that when we talk about those particular writers. Gothic writers, kind of on the opposite end, um, another type of romanticism. They have an interest in fantasy and the supernatural. So the book that I mentioned before, Wieland by Charles Brockton Brown, he does have an interest in rationalism and the age of reason. He also has an interest in fantasy and the supernatural. So you can see both of these kind of competing for our attention throughout his book. It's really interesting. The Evil Thoughts of Man, which contrasted with the transcendentalists who really looked at the, um, the benefits of mankind, the great works that they are capable of. So when we get into a book like um, Walden by Henry David Thoreau is a transcendentalist book. He would have considered himself a transcendentalist. He's talking a lot about nature um, and a lot about individualism and self-reliance. A book like um, Uncle Tom's Cabin has some transcendentalist themes, but also a lot of other shades of romanticism, particularly a type of writing called sentimentality, which we will discuss when we get to that book. So my point is that a lot of these writers, you can you can see just by a few examples that I've given you, they're not just all one thing. Um, Frederick Douglass's work is a slave narrative. He has some transcendentalist beliefs, um, it seems. He has some features of his writing that are romantic and others that are a lot more realistic, which kind of pushes forward into the next phase of American writing with realism. So. Um, yeah, so look, you know, look at that pendulum and where people are and what aspects of these that they're using. Um, here are some quotes from transcendentalists. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. I went into the woods because I wished to live deliberately and to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Um, Edgar Allan Poe would fall into the Gothic realm of this particular literary movement. The Scarlet Letter is also a romantic book. Uh, many people have heard of that one, as is Moby Dick. Some of the, some of the classics there. So early slave narratives were really printed as books or short pamphlets. And again, um, it's saying 1770 to 1850. When we get to reading Frederick Douglass, we'll talk about how that 
really went on until the 1950s where people who had um, then were quite elderly but who had been slaves gave a lot of their narratives to talk about their experiences. But the early narratives in the 1700s were really short books or pamphlets. They focused on religious redemption, moving from paganism to Christianity. Most of the writers were born in Africa, unlike some of the later books where people were born in the colonies or born in the United States. And some described leaving of their own free will and being grateful for the opportunity to come to the new world and be converted to Christianity. I want to be really clear that some or many of these writers may have been coerced. Um, they, there's also some who were really in indentured servitude. So before the laws of slavery changed, um, indentured servitude would not have been unusual in other countries where people were taken captive and held for a period of years, or if they were in debt in some way, um, or they pledged themselves to work for so many years before being let go. So the early slave narratives, a lot of people now see them as kind of problematic, but they're very interesting to study to see um, and try to figure out quite exactly what was going on. Other narratives describe being in Africa before being kidnapped and held again almost as prisoners of war. Sorry. Later on, they focused on the hardships of slavery, being both American and captive. Frederick Douglass has a wonderful um, speech in addition to his books called What to a Slave is the Fourth of July that really exemplifies this um, tension. Uh, I am an American, but I'm not an American. I am in a country that says that there should be freedoms, and yet I am not free. They focus on what readers can do to change themselves and their society, and they really demonstrate the hypocrisy between Christian words and the actions of the slave owners. They were beginning to increase in popularity and were more widely published, particularly as we lead up to the Civil War, as um, people as people became more passionate about ending slavery. They gave way to also fictional novels and poems in the slave narrative style that further supported abolition. So Uncle Tom's Cabin, which we'll be reading is an interesting book because, in, and again, as many of these, in some ways it was really ahead of its time, arguing for the abolition of slaves. And in other ways, she um, still has some, some racist beliefs that um, are not in keeping with our time today, but would have been part of the belief system and schools of thought in which she was living. But she really drew a lot from various slave narratives to develop that story. And we'll talk about um, the, the real life of some of the people that inspired her characters as well. They continued, as I said, as after slavery ended well into the 1950s, more and more people who had been born into slavery were willing and able to tell their stories. And the focus at that point was civil rights and further progress. So yes, we came out of slavery, but we are in a situation where we're not allowed to live in certain neighborhoods, we're not allowed to go to certain schools, we're not allowed to vote, even though um, technically on paper we should be allowed to vote, right? So um, that particular writing project had a very large impact. So here are some examples. Um, These are some early ones. 12 Years a Slave, you may have heard of. There's Frederick Douglass. And that's Harriet Jacobs who wrote um, Diary of a Slave Girl. Oops. 
Okay, so that is the basic overview. Um, I hope that you have a, a pretty good idea of some of the features to look for with different books that we're going to be reading. And as we go into each book, we'll be talking more about how they fit into these literary traditions. So just wanted to give you a good overview of um, what those traditions were and the timeline. And I am interested to see your thoughts on our first